So welcome back to the channel. This week I want to put out this video in addition to our regular um, videos because I've had a couple of people ask me about some of the terms I've used in the videos and to be honest there's a lot of uh, nautical, ter nautical terms out there that are used and if you don't understand it that's completely okay because I didn't and it's helpful to understand. So I made this primer and hopefully you'll find this helpful. So let's get into it. So often we put up specifications and there's a bunch of terms on the page. So let's start with LOA, which is length overall. So exactly as it sounds, that is the length of the boat from its longest point, usually the bowsprit to the short back of the boat, the, um, the swim platform. So that's the length overall. The length water line is exactly as that sounds as well. That is the um, length from where the boat hits the water. So we're often where the painted water line is and that is typically you know a good bit shorter than the overall length. The reason that matters and we'll get into that is there's a calculation if you own a displacement type boat that uses that dimension. So that's length water line. Beam is the width of the boat at its widest point. Most power bo boats are sort of shaped straight and then they come to a, a natural point unlike sailboats which tend to be a little bit more um, they're narrow at the stern and narrow at the bow. So the beam is the width of the boat at its widest point. The draft is the depth of the boat from the water line to the bottom of the boat. Useful for knowing in, in how much water uh, that particular boat needs, whether it be your slip or your mooring. Um, typically below that depth you want to have a good, I like to have a good six feet below my own draft. So my boat Calypso 2 draws three and a half feet. So typically I don't come in, in into an area less than 10 feet. That's typically where I um, anchor when I go um, to the beach or something like that. Dry weight. That is the weight of the boat empty. So that's the boat with its engines and all its basic equipment, but it does not include fuel or water or people or supplies or food. Um, so it's useful for comparison. So when you're looking at different boats, you compare the dry weight, then you know it's just the weight of the boat without any variables, half tank, full tank, you know, number of people on board. So that's the dry weight. Often you'll see a term fully loaded, or if you read um, um, boating tests, they'll say test conditions, and that'll say we ran with a half tank of fuel, two people on board, and no supplies. That's just to give you an idea of what the boat was carrying so when they measure its performance whether it be its speed or its um, fuel economy then you know it's got more weight on board than typically the would be the that dry weight displacement is also a measure of weight but it's not actually measuring the weight of the boat technically it's measuring the amount of water that it is displacing because effectively that's why a boat floats in other words the weight of the water that it displaces is less than than the, the weight of the boat so the boat floats and so you're displacing a certain amount of water and and that is generally equivalent to what the boat weighs when it as it sits in the water the two terms are somewhat synonymous but they are measuring technically two different things and then the range of the boat it is how far the boat can travel on a given amount of fuel um, Typically, range is given with a 10% reserve. Um, you usually don't, if a boat carries 100 gallons, you probably would only you know, plan on using 90 of those gallons for a couple of reasons. One, it's always good to plan a trip based on um, how much you have with a little bit of, of reserve. Plus, you know, you never really want to be dragging the last of the fuel off the bottom of the tank. It's usually not the best fuel anyway. So um, you always want to plan a trip with um, a, at least a 10% reserve, maybe even a 20% reserve. That way, you know, if you get into a situation where you have more current or more tide or wind and you're pushing against it and not making the distance you'd like to, you know that you have the fuel to do it as opposed to planning on using every last drop. So those are some basic terms under specifications. So what else would we have here? So here are some measures. So we often see you know, knots versus miles per hour. Sometimes, often you will see um, performance given in both, but this is just useful to know. So one mile per hour is equal to 1.15 knots. So the knot speed, therefore, is slower than the equivalent miles per hour speed. Just useful to know. Horsepower versus kilowatts. You don't see kilowatts 
measured much here in the US, but often if you see reviews, and I sometimes read international boating magazines, you will see the power of the engine in, rated in kilowatts as opposed to horsepower. It's just a, another measure of work, but it is, you can um, translate one to the other. So in this case, one horsepower equals 0.745 kilowatts. Just another useful fact to have. Similarly, you, you, gallons versus liters, you'll see um, tankage listed in liters in sort of boats that come from overseas and where you, we tend to use, because they're metric, of course, um, and we tend to use gallons. So the conversion for that is one gallon equals 3.875 liters. You often see that in, you know, in, um, not only in tankage, but in performance. You know, we, re we review fuel efficiency and how many gallons per hour does it burn. Well, they'll say how many liters per hour it burns. But as you can see, there's quite a difference between liters and gallons. So it's very easy to get, say, they'll say the boat burns 40 liters an hour. And you're like, whoa, that's a lot. But then if you divide it by 3.875, you're like, well, maybe that's not a lot. So it's just something to be aware of, of and it's useful to, as, a, as a reference. Other terms that I thought might be helpful. So um, if you're traveling, if you're cruising, which we do a lot of, and you're doing some navigation, and if you're following um, a course laid out at either in a chart book or in other some other set of directions, you often see magnetic north versus true north. And quite simply, as you can see down in my picture at the bottom, um, um, true north is the geographic north. It's the North Pole, right? It's the top of the top of the planet. It's a fixed point, never moves. The magnetic north, however, is slightly off kilter from the true north and it does move because it's based on the earth's magnetic field it can deviate and move around sometimes and so the difference between the geographic true north and magnetic point north is often referred to as variation or deviation now of course as you can imagine a compass points to magnetic north right and so well, because that's what that's in fact what in what, what the needle is measuring is point to magnetic north and that's fine. Most coastal cruising is done with directions given in magnetic. If you look at a chart, you will see the compass rows at various points placed on that chart. And that chart will show true north and it will show magnetic north. Um, I mean, and so what you do, what, if, you are, if you are cruising globally, the navigation is, tends to be done in true north. So you have to make either mental or paper calculations to adjust the magnetic north to true north. It's just sort of more custom than anything else, but coastal cruising, following your compass and magnetic north is completely okay. Dead rise. So in my last video, I did a rather cryptic um, whiteboard version of what dead rise is because I sometimes refer to it in some of these virtual boat walkthroughs I talk about dead rise so let's I thought I put together a little bit better uh, schematic of what it is so dead rise is essentially the measurement of the aft section of the boat that uh, it's the measurement of the angle relative to the horizontal that is formed by by the rear sections so as you can see in this right here, and, and again, these are not actual. I put these de these degrees here not because they're actual, but just for reference. So if you were to take a compass to them, you won't find that they're 23, 15, and 5. It's more representative. So you can see I have a note down here. So a 23 degree dead rise is fairly steep. A 15 degree de dead rise is fairly modest. And 5 degree or less is pretty much flat. And, and then this is the angle right in here. So if you were to measure this angle actually, I'm certain it's not 23 degrees, but it's something. And so, but it's the angle of the bottom of the hull relative to the horizontal plane. What it, the difference it makes is the steeper the dead rise, the more sea kindly a planing boat will be. It tracks well and it, it, it handles the waves much better. However, as you can imagine, the deeper the V, the more it's, you know, push down into the water. And so the fuel efficiency is less, right? In other words, it's a deeper hull and you're, you're, you know, and the fuel efficiency of a planing boat is really is a function of the friction between the water and the boat. And the more boat that's in the water, the more friction that you're going to have. And so therefore the more horsepower it's going to take to push it to a given speed. 
So it's a balance. It's a trade-off when you design a hull. The how deep you want the dead rise to be versus how do you want the performance. Often you will see boats that sort of do a compromise. So I'll give you a couple of numbers. Again, the Sea Ray 310 that we had, Calypso 1, was a 23 degree dead rise. She had a fairly deep stern. She was a, at 31 feet, she was an excellent sea kindly boat, but she burned a little bit of fuel. Calypso 2, the 400 sedan bridge, has an 18 degree dead rise, which is still pretty typical. It's average, but it, it still performs well, but that tries to you know, provide, make, allow the boat to burn a little bit less fuel, which it does generally because it has the diesel engines, but it has an 18 degree dead rise. A very shallow or flat dead rise would be like a skiff, right? A skiff or a, a rowboat. No dead rise, and it just uh, glides over the top of the water. If you were to have a large boat that has a um, zero degree or, or minimal degree dead rise, you'll get a lot of hull slap. You know, as, as, as the bo boat goes through the water, it will slap far more, um, and so it'll be a less comfortable ride. It won't track as well. Um, so, as I say, everything is a trade-off. Hull speed. So, as I mentioned, we were just talking a moment ago about how a planing hull goes through the water. As I said, the limitation of speed on a planing hull is really a function of the horsepower and the friction of the water and the hull. You know, there's other factors, of course, and if you get up really high speeds, then you talk about air factors when you're talking about racing boats. But in a cruising boat, it, what, you know, what limits the speed of a planing boat because it's up on top of the water is the amount of horsepower and then how much friction there is. A displacement boat, like a trawler or a boat that's made, not made to get on top of the water but push through the water, it's different. And in fact, there is a theoretical hull calculation that tells you the possible speed. And what that calculation is, and it looks complex, but it really isn't, is 1.3 times the square root of the length at the waterline. So there's that number again that we talked about at the beginning under specifications. The length waterline is that line right there that is the length of the boat at the waterline. So you multiply, take the square root of that and multiply it by 1.3, and that will give you the theoretical hull speed. Now, it doesn't mean that when it, the boat hits that speed, it just stops. What it means is you can push a displacement boat faster than its theoretical speed, but it becomes very inefficient. It's kind of complicated and I won't go into it here, but suffice it to say is as the hull speeds up and exceeds hull speed, what happens is the stern sections of the boat no longer support it, so it starts to squat. And so what that does is it starts dragging the stern through the water and sort of pushing itself down into the water water and so the efficiency you gain of a sort of modest speed displacement boat is lost as you try to exceed hull speed that's why you will typically see boats like these Nordhavens or Grand Banks trawlers that are, dis that are displacement typically will cruise anywhere between seven and nine knots that's typical if you do the math it's typical for a boat that's in the 30 to 50 foot range you know, if you just take the, do the quick math, say what's the square root of a boat with um, a 36-foot water line, so that's 6, right? 6 times 6 is 36, and multiply 6 by 1.3, you're talking about 7.5 knots, something like that, that's hull speed. And that's and to push the boat to that speed take, does not take a little, that much power. Um, if, you, if you're familiar with and take a look at some of the Nordhaven boats, which are designed as world cruisers and very efficient, their, take their 55-foot Nordhaven. The 55-foot Nordhaven, I think, has a 300-horsepower diesel. It's a John Deere engine marinized by Lugger. You know, a 300-horsepower diesel on a 55-foot boat, but that's all it takes to push that boat up to its hull speed, and that engine will run all day, every day, and burn, probably burning six, seven gallons an hour and just keep running and running and running. So, you, so it's very efficient. It's not very fast, but it's very efficient. So... That's that. Oh, so here we are at the end. Um, I hope this was helpful. And if it was, please make sure to subscribe, share, and like. Um, if there's any other terms you'd like us to define, we're happy to do that. I intend to put this document on our website at cruisingcalypso.com. In fact, we will be re-releasing um, our website in about another month or so and there'll be a whole section dedicated to material you can get and download if you subscribe so um, stay tuned for that but i will put reference material like this um, on the website so you can access it for free and take a look so thanks again and we'll see you on our next boat walkthrough this week
Bye.